So we have two talks that are still <laughs> to go this afternoon, uh, the first of which is uh, from Professor Dan Haber of St. Louis University. Uh, Dan is also somebody that I met while I was at graduate school in the University of Arizona. He was, uh, he was already out of graduate school by the time I was there, so he was a visiting uh, professor at the time. Um, but he was, he was in the somewhat early stages of his work on happiness uh, at that point. Uh, and since then, it has uh, blossomed tremendously to the point where, like, if you put on a conference on happiness uh, somewhere in the United States, <laughs> you kind of better invite uh, Dan Haber. And even if you've only got four people on the agenda, Dan had better be one of them because he knows his stuff uh, when it comes to happiness. He's a philosopher by training, uh, but he has been doing a lot of really fascinating <laughs> interdisciplinary work on theories of happiness, well-being, working with a lot of psychologists, uh, economists. In fact, he has a... a grant right now from the John Templeton Foundation uh, to work on happiness and well-being, integrating research across the <coughs> disciplines. I believe it's a $5.1 <coughs> million dollar grant. Uh, is, that, yeah. is that about right? So that, that's a good start to happiness right there. Um, <laughs> he, he is the author of uh, several books on the topic. He, uh, he has a book called, a really terrific little book called The Pursuit of Unhappiness, The Elusive Psychology of Well-Being. Um, and if you want a shorter uh, introduction to uh, current academic thinking about happiness, he has something called Happiness, a Very Short Introduction, uh, which should be right up your alley. And then he has, I think, three more books on happiness uh, in the works. So uh, you, can, you can read a lot of Dan Habern uh, if you're so inclined. And I believe that this talk here will um, be a terrific inducement to do so. So I'll turn things over to Professor Dan Habern. Uh, thank you, Matt, and uh, uh, thank you, Angel and Megan and the IHS people and USD and uh, all of you all for being here. Um, uh, this is just a really cool event uh, they put on, and um, so I hope you'll get enough happiness out of this, or unhappiness anyway. Um, uh, let me start off by giving you a little sense of where this is going. Uh, my main interest here is in something... Uh, it's called well-being policy, um, and it, that is well, policy that is aimed at promoting uh, well-being or alleviating ill-being, and that includes happiness policy, but is not limited to that. And, um, uh, and one form of well-being policy that's gotten a lot of attention in recent years, uh, how many people have heard of nudges? Okay, so this is one kind of idea that has been really big recently, just won a Nobel Prize, uh, one of the main guys for it that we'll be talking about. So this is one approach to well-being policy that um, uh, uh, has been getting a lot of attention, and I want to focus on that. Um, I think there are some real problems with nudges, the way at least they've been talked about by uh, the leading proponents. Uh, I think there's a risk of them being intrusive, and uh, it's also not clear to me how much good they're likely to do. Uh, at the same time, I want to suggest actually maybe these guys with their big ideas haven't been thinking big enough and that actually there may be a more ambitious role for nudges in policy, uh, but um, oddly in some ways less problematic and uh, in, namely in the context of thinking about lifestyle infrastructure as I'll call it. So for a little bit of background for... Uh, this is, you know, in recent years, uh, I'd say over the last decades, but especially the last 10 years or so, the idea of well-being policy, sometimes called happiness policy, uh, although I think that's narrower, um, has really been getting a lot of attention. And it basically comes down to uh, this idea, which, you, um, I mean, Bobby Kennedy said in one of his speeches in the 60s, uh, John LBJ talked about it that basically uh, just counting money isn't good enough as a way of seeing how we're doing. Economic growth is really important, but uh, policy maybe shouldn't be as single-mindedly focused as it has uh, arguably been on things like gross domestic product. Um, so basically the idea is that our policies, uh, that really we need to look at how our policies affect people's actual quality of life. How are their lives going? Are we making people's making people's lives better or worse. Uh, and I, to me, this is especially important in the context of sustainability or environmental concerns. And one thing that I teach uh, every year is environmental ethics. Uh, and, and I think a huge question going forward is how uh, can we sustain good lives uh, for 
uh, everybody, uh, even as we face the resource constraints that we're confronting. Uh, now, what's happening is, in, especially in like, I think it was like 2012, 2013, 41 nations adopted some measure of well-being as part of their uh, policy. Um, the uh, little tiny Buddhist kingdom of Bhutan in the Himalayas, this is a picture I took when I was working with the government there uh, for uh, about a week. Um, they've made a gross national happiness actually <laughs> their policy goal. Um, and uh, that's been a subject of a great deal of controversy. But uh, the UK, France, uh, Germany, lots of countries have been starting to take well-being pol uh, policy seriously. You don't have to measure well-being or happiness in order to include it in policy. Bhutan was doing it for decades without any sort of measures. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you just sort of commonsensically, well, if you build clinics and give people health care, um, give them better education, uh, that will be that will improve their quality of life most likely, and that's what's happened. Uh, just to give you an example, though, of one uh, of one kind of measure one might use. This is not an actual measure in use. I hope some variant of this will be soon. Um, this is a, a prototype of a happiness scale that I'm working on now with the psychologist. Uh, the actual scale will definitely be different. Uh, we're running the analyses now in our initial pilots. Um, I prefer to use the term emotional well-being when I'm talking to policy people or, or academics because the word happiness has different meanings. Um, and uh, so Mark Labar, when he was talking about happiness as something more like your whole life going well, that's one perfectly legitimate uh, use of the word happiness. We do sometimes mean that. Sometimes we mean something more, I think, like this, emotional well-being. Um, and this is really, and actually this scale, by the way, is based on mental health scales for depression, anxiety, <laughs> and stress. Um, uh, it's not, you don't see like, you're not asking how happy are you? Uh, you can measure happiness that way. I think it's a terrible way to measure happiness. Um, will this be a good one? I think it will be. Uh, I hope so, <laughs> but we'll see. Um, so uh, uh, you hang out with me, you get clowns. Um, so uh, the well-being policy has gotten a lot of, you know, drawn a lot of fire. And especially in the United States, uh, this is one country that really hasn't caught on particularly. Um, and I think the biggest reason is people worry that it's too paternalistic. That it's sort of like the nanny state gone mad. Uh, this is actually a headline in the Daily Mail. Look out, the happiness police are coming. Um, and I actually don't know what they were envisioning, like forced marches to yo laughter yoga camps or um, <laughs> meditation at gunpoint. I don't know. Um, I actually think there are quite legitimate concerns, though. Uh, just this might be a little bit overstating it. Um, but the idea, and there's, this is, uh, uh, I, at a certain level, a very plausible idea that happiness and well-being is ultimately the individual's responsibility. It's not the government's job to make me happy. I actually sort of agree with that, understood in a certain way. Um, but then they go on to think, well, what the government should just do is promote freedom. And that can either take the form of promoting resources like economic growth. So if you have more money in your pocket, you are freer in a way, right? You can spend, you can do more things the more money you have. Um, or we might just promote capabilities or opportunities. Uh, one reason that I think education is super important is even if it doesn't make people happier, even if it doesn't contribute to your well-being, which I think it does, um, just giving people opportunities is important. But not everything that matters is a matter of freedom. Some, uh, some of the things that concern us are not actually mainly a problem of freedom. Uh, so you can imagine that you could be very affluent, have lots and lots of options in life. And I want to focus here on the case of young people in the United States. Uh, this is something that um, some of you may identify with. Um, you know, you could, the world could be your oyster, yet you could be miserable. Um, you could have all the freedom in the world and kind of systematically, uh, at my own, uh, the medical school at my university, at St. Louis University, in 2008, they did something unusual. They actually looked to see how their students were doing. Um, and uh, suicides are a common problem with med students, by the way. Um, and what they found shocked them, that 27% showed clinically significant uh, symptoms of depression. 56% uh, clinically significant symptoms of anxiety disorder. Um, 
uh, that doesn't seem great. In my wife's hometown of Palo Alto, my in-laws still live there. Uh, to be honest, in today's environment, I don't think I would want to raise my kids there. Uh, Some of you may actually be from there. Um, uh, there. There's been a rash, actually several rashes of suicides. I think at least 11 in the last 10 years or so. Um, and they've now posted, uh, there's actually volunteers hanging out at, um, uh, well, now it's guards. They've hired guards and set up cameras to monitor railroad crossings. So the young people of Palo Alto, this is the town where my wife grew up a couple blocks from Steve Jobs. You know, th this is Google, Apple, one of the wealthiest places on the planet. Um, this is so their children don't throw themselves in front of locomotives and kill themselves, because uh, that's how they're killing themselves. Um, uh, uh, so it's, it's quite uh, remarkable. Uh, my same uh, colleagues at SLU also looked at a, uh, another high school in Fremont across the bay. Uh, this is much less affluent, but still, a, uh, you know, not, certainly not poor school district. Um, and they found that 54% of the students, they actually made the, our med students seem happy. Um, uh, out of 2,000 students in the high school, 54% of them showed moderate to severe symptoms of depression, 80% of anxiety. Um, actually, one of the researchers told me, I, I don't have this written down to verify, uh, and obviously you don't measure everything, but of the populations that have been studied like this, this is the most distressed population that's ever been seen. Um, that's at least not true now because last year they found some refugees in New Zealand uh, in a camp uh, who, who scored even worse. But anyway, um, there's something, you know, there's some sort of quality of life issues here, right? And it isn't just, uh, it's not clear that, it's that they lack freedom or options. Uh, in fact, that may be precisely part of their problem. I think willfully to ignore this kind of information and setting policy would be unconscionable. We have to pay attention um, uh, if, you know, this sort of thing is going on in our communities. Also, if we want to do well-being policy, it doesn't require, there's no necessary connection between well-being policy and paternalism. It doesn't necessarily mean enlarging the government. It could. Um, it's not even a special kind of policy. There's no... You know, there's no set of policies that like, you call these happiness policies and, and they're like unlike anything that's ever been done. Um, all that we're really talking about is considering a broader range of information than we traditionally have. And in particular, information about how people's lives are actually going. Not just what they could do or be, but actually what's actually happening in their lives. What's their quality of life? Um, so... And we've actually been doing well-being policy in various forms forever. Um, so public health programs, um, uh, you know, maintaining safe water supplies so people aren't poisoned by the water. That, you know, because uh, we don't like being poisoned. It's, it's bad for us. <laughs> um, vaccination programs. Um, you might want to prioritize unemployment uh, over economic growth because, uh, and there's plenty of evidence for this, that actually, you know, not having a job is, has a much bigger impact on your well-being than having less money as a general rule. So, uh, uh, so maybe that's more important to focus on just for quality of life reasons. That's an example of well-being policy. So well-being policy in general, we can put constraints on it. We can place rules to keep it within certain bounds depending on what we think the appropriate rule of government is. Um, and there's going to be a lot of variation on this, but I think a plausible rule here is that it ought to treat people with respect. Um, it should be constrained that way. And again, some of these cases I don't think are paternalistic at all, but others are. So now we turn to nudges. So this was introduced, um, what, in the early 2000s, I think, by the term comes from uh, Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler. Thaler just won the Nobel Prize in economics. And um, they, uh, it's kind of problematic how they define nudges. I think they call a lot of things nudges that they shouldn't. Um, I'll just suggest here that what a nudge is, is it's something that happens when the environment influences your behavior in a non-rational way. Um, and, and it does determine it. So it influences your behavior, but doesn't determine what you do, and it's not rational. So, for, uh, so you're free to do otherwise. You're not 
you know, it's not like you're the Manchurian candidate and you've been programmed to do what they want. Um, and also, crucially, nudges are different from persuasion. It, it, it's not giving people reasons uh, and persuading them to change their mind. And it's also not just a matter of incentives, although incentives can have a role in creating nudges. Um, so if you just charge more money, then rationally people will buy less of the item, you say. Um, that's an incentive. A nudge is more like, here's some examples. Uh, well, actually, the most familiar example of nudges might be from advertising. Right? I, I, I assume nobody thinks advertising works through rational persuasion normally, right? It's just feel good. It sort of just kind of nudges you into wanting to buy the product. Um, and in fact, it's, it's so good at doing it in this subtle way that a lot of people think, oh, that doesn't have any effect on me. Um, my wife is a marketing professional, and um, uh, her nudges work pretty well on doctors. Um, and actually, one of the things I have to be careful not to nudge too much or in the wrong way. Um, so, uh, but the, here's two uh, favorite examples from Sunstein and Thaler. Uh, one is the, the cafeteria example. Um, if you're concerned you want people to eat healthier lunches, what you can do is rearrange the items in the cafeteria. So maybe you move dessert to be in a less convenient spot. It's less visible, it's less tempting there. Um, whereas, right, when you're at the grocery store at um, your Target or something, uh, it, they'll put the candy right there by the register uh, because they want to nudge you into buying the candy. Um, well, you might think, well, so one thing we could do in policy is nudge people into not eating candy by moving the desserts around. So that's one example. Another example, which um, I think is more interesting, is with retirement savings. This is a big deal, right? Whether you save for retirement and and um, uh, and, and so imagine that you're at the employer and you're filling out the paperwork and and you're asked, um, do you want to set aside part of your paycheck every month to save for retirement? And uh, now suppose it. What actually happens? is whether people check that, whether people save for retirement depends very heavily on whether they have to go to the immense labor of checking a box on the form. One of the bi biggest predictors of whether people save or not is whether the default option on the form is to save or to not save. Now, whatever your philosophy of saving is, I bet it doesn't uh, your idea of what's an appropriate amount to save or what's rational behavior isn't, well, what's the one where I don't have to check a box? <laughs> um, so, but actually that's, so basically, um, whether employers set the default option on, on the forms for retirement savings to save or not save can make the difference perhaps between people in the future having to eat cat food in their golden years because they didn't save enough. Uh, it's quite a weighty choice, and um, by just changing the default option to save, the thought is that you're nudging people into saving. They're still free to do otherwise. If they don't want to save, if they really care, they'll just check the box and, and opt out. Um, now, are nudges paternalistic? Not necessarily. Has anyone encountered uh, urinal flies? Um, so uh, this is especially popular in Europe, uh, although not in Germany, apparently, because I think in Germany, maybe men can be at least, uh, well, this is my own uh, experience anyway. Uh, I suspect it's just that German men don't need help not peeing on the floor. Um, but anyway, the idea is uh, because if you've been in men's bathrooms, you know they're disgusting. Uh, well, they put flies in the urinal, which encourage men, instead of peeing on the floor, they do it on the fly. Um, and because and they want to hit that. Um, and I, maybe if the, the fly shrieked in pain, it would be even more popular. I don't know. But um, so uh, that I don't think is paternalistic, right? It's uh, because it's, it's other people's business where you do your business, right? Uh, this to protect other people. From what's going on, I, I, I'm sorry, that was kind of a gross example. I, I could have shown you a, a close-up so you could really see the fly look like, but uh, nobody really wants to look that close to the urinal. Um, so on the other hand, 
If the idea is to promote their well-being, like with the dessert example or the, the savings plan, then maybe it is paternalistic because then you're shaping the person's volition for their own good. You're shaping someone else's choices uh, for their own good. And you're not doing it through reasoning. You're doing it through what's arguably a kind of manipulation. So is that kind of paternalism, if it is paternalism, a problem? Uh, I think it might be, and certainly in some cases it is. But suppose you would want to want to be nudged if you were consulted about it. Um, suppose if somebody asked you, like, yeah, just set the default in the retirement form. I'm terrible with money. Just, um, and I was, I, I'd be the first to say, yeah, do not trust me with my uh, money because um, I have, I'm in charge of this grant. And, Anyway, <laughs> um, I'm driving the accountants bananas. Um, so, uh, uh, and but so suppose nudging is based on you have good reason to think people would want it. Uh, maybe it isn't objectionably paternalistic. And there are often times where we think it's okay. We call it soft paternalism, or that's one one use for that term, where you're just look. Um, uh, we live in a large society. Sometimes it's helpful to have, we know that our, we have shortcomings in our decision making. Um, maybe it's a little bit like, um, you know, you're just not in sound mind and, uh, 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 or uh, the famous example is you're about to cross a bridge and you're just going to fall off and die. Um, and there's no way of stopping. So somebody pushes you out of the way. Well, that's paternalistic, but um, it's probably okay. You're probably not going to complain. Um, so now the question is, why would, what's the point of nudging? Why do we even need this? Aren't we rational creatures? Um, well, we certainly are rational um, in, a, in a certain way. And I actually think that the standard economist view that we are basically rational in most of our choices is a useful approximation for many purposes and is close enough for many purposes. Here's the problem, though. Uh, as every Greek tragedy would, would show you, it only takes one mistake to really screw up your life. Um, and we know that we have weaknesses. We know we have all sorts of kinds of irrationality. And there's, uh, so this book basically de details all sorts of ways we can uh, bollocks things up. And, um, and so a lot of these mistakes are systematic and predictable. So, um, so one reason to think is, you know, that, uh, 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 it may be that often our everyday choices don't actually fit up very well with our deeper values. And then we end up, you know, so you sort of get what you want day to day. You're just doing what you want. Um, but then, you know, at the end of it all, you're wondering, really, was this the life that I wanted? Um, and you end up like this guy eating, uh, <laughs> sitting with garbage in your lap um, <laughs> and playing an outdated video game. This is the most important psychological phenomenon, though, I think, that drives, pardon me, the need for nudging. Um, the caffeine is taking effect. Uh, so is uh, what, I, what I'll call extreme situation sensitivity. It's best known from the situation of psychology literature, but you don't have to buy the strong view, which I don't think many researchers hold anymore, um, that personality or character isn't important. We know personality and character are important, and not everybody, uh, you know, is uh, responds equally to these situations. Not everybody becomes like in the Stanford Prison Experiment. Um, basically, they took college students at Stanford and divided half of them. Uh, they created a fake prison. They all knew it's a fake prison. Half of them pretended to be guards. Half of them pretended to be inmates. It was supposed to go for two weeks. They had to call it off after six days. They really should have called it off earlier, but the experimenter himself got caught up in the excitement um, and let it go too far. But basically, the, the guards got really into it, and they started acting like the guys on, was it Oz, or, you know, uh, sadistic prison guards. It was really, um, uh, in fact, this is one of these things where uh, when Abu Ghraib happened, uh, a lot of us who knew this research we're predicting that that was exactly what was going to happen given the way we were setting things up. We were creating a, a, an environment where that was likely to happen. Anyway, so uh, ordinary nice college students, uh, California college students end up uh, acting like barbarians 
in a fake uh, prison experiment, and it was very easy to get him to do that. Lots of other examples, including nudges. I'm just going to mention one other, which, uh, as far as I know, no one else has really explored this in the literature. But I think there's a really fascinating phenomenon with biculturals, uh, sojourners, migrants. Um, if you're a person of color or your, uh, or your home is not in the United States, uh, this, this experience might resonate with you. If you find yourself going between different cultural environments, uh, you may find that your mindset, really, all sorts of things change as you go between those environments. Right? So um, you might have heard of it as code switching. There's a lot of different terms for it. But, um, and I think there's evidence you'll get even personality shifts between environments. I actually, I am certain that you do. So, and the, the, basically the upshot of the psychology, and by the way, there's been a lot of replication issues in the relevant literature. Um, so some experiments haven't held up, but uh, the overall moral, the, the overall picture I think holds up very well. There's abundant evidence for it. We're super sensitive to our environment. It actually makes sense. This is not a bug. This is a feature in human psychology. This is what enables us to get along with each other. We evolved in, a, in circumstances where basically every member of the human species pretty much had to be able to get along with every other one, right? Because you don't know who you're going to end up with. And you're probably going to end up sleeping in a hut with your mother-in-law. So um, you better be pretty adaptable. You better be you know, able to kind of fit in and adapt to the circumstances. This is good for us, and I actually think um, it would be really fascinating to study this, but um, I think there's a kind of vice that could attend a, a kind of rigidity for somebody who isn't susceptible to these effects at all. Or you know, Actually, I think that's impossible given human psychology, but somebody who's not susceptible enough, where you just sort of you have trouble kind of getting along with people because you're rigid, you're set, you don't kind of fit in with whatever crowd you're in. The trick is... Um, how do you manage to have a, a, a nice adaptability that works well and you get along with people and you're empathetic um, without like also risking that then you find yourself taking a machete to uh, Tutsi neighbors, right? Um, uh, so, you know, so it's, it's not without um, shortcomings, but I think this is a healthy, normal feature, uh, you know, feature of human psychology, given that we're awash in nudges. That is, the environment is, is nudging us in a myriad ways all the time. The lighting in this room, the, uh, let's face it, kind of crappy fluorescent lighting, there's evidence that that's not great for people's moods. Um, that might have some subtle effect on how you interact with somebody after you leave the room. Um, it might cause you, if you don't like the talk, blame the lighting. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and... If you can't escape it, why not just do it on purpose? Um, and, you know, it does seem to me like some nudges, like the default options for savings, boy, that's a huge benefit. It's hard to see how big a risk there could be. Um, and most people would probably be glad of it. Uh, that seems like it's probably okay. Um, but in other cases, maybe not so much. By the way, if you can't read the uh, little text in the cartoon, I don't want to sound simplistic, but I think a smaller couch with fewer throw pillows would help this marriage a lot. Um, <laughs> so, uh, by the way, oh, this is a watching eyes intervention. This has been replicated a number of times. Um, if you have a coffee pot in your office and you want everybody to contribute money and you want to minimize freeloaders, one thing that helps is posting a picture of eyes on the wall um, so that you feel like you're being watched. Um, I don't think anybody rationally believes they're really being watched, they're gonna get caught if they don't put in money. <laughs> it's just somehow this creates this feeling and it nudges you into donating. Um, so uh, the problem is, um, again, we, what we're talking about at least approximates manipulation and it's gonna be abused. Um, again, think of your least favorite politicians. And it, this is really helpful because I, I know I tend, when I get a, an idea that I think is really grand, I think of my favorite politicians implementing it or whatever. And, um, but really, think of your least favorite politician being in charge of it. Um, it's going to be abused, and it's not always going to go well. Um, uh, it's going to be hard for citizens to monitor this stuff. I don't know about you, but I won't have time to keep track of... I actually don't know what Cass Sunstein was up to. By the way, Cass Sunstein was made the nudge czar for uh, President Obama's administration. 
So he was charged with creating these kind of interventions. I don't actually even, I should probably know more about what he did, but um, you know, we don't have time to track what they're doing with the desserts um, in, the, in the cafeteria. Um, nudges themselves may arise in a kind of slippery slope issue where creating this regime where you're encouraging people to meddle in people's choices in, in, in the government um, might kind of foster even more than we already have a technocratic government mindset where you know, officials think they know better than us and they're gonna um, start you know, just really be meddlesome. Um, and uh, but that meddling thing is, is gonna resonate more with people who have businesses or are ranchers or farmers or fisher people or whatever who actually, I live a lifestyle where you know, I don't see that much government regulation that I can tell. Um, I'm probably just stupid, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so, and most of the, here's the thing also, mostly what they're doing is they're targeting specific choices, like what you, what, whether you have pie for lunch. Um, and these aren't really that important choices, I don't think. Um, you know, the say, retirement savings, but most of them aren't like that. So um, I have not been able to put together a compelling vision from Sunstein and Thaler about how this is supposed to really make for a better society. Um, and so given the risks and given the apparently limited benefits, do we want officials to be actively seeking opportunities to nudge? Um, so I want to, that having said that, I want to suggest that actually maybe what's going on is these guys are kind of missing the big picture. Um, they're focusing too much on the trees, missing the forest. Think of two different ways you could go about nudging. The standard approach that we've been talking about, call it point interventions. That is, you're intervening in specific choices. Um, alternatively, you could engage in stage setting. That is, you're changing the background conditions within which people make choices. Um, I think it may not be wise to focus our policy on influencing specific choices. There might be a major role for nudges in, uh, in a stage setting role, and in fact, Given that I've, I've claimed that uh, nudges are inevitable, they're everywhere, they're, we're awash in them, you actually can't avoid making policy choices that create all sorts of nudges. Um, I think it's, uh, uh, I don't know if this is the best term for it, but I'm gonna call it lifestyle infrastructure. The idea is this is the, the physical and social conditions that shape the way we live. Um, and so the built environment, the natural environment, uh, just having green plants around can make a real difference in your behavior. Um, the social environment is especially potent, right? Various cultural norms, institutions, practices. Um, if you are in Italy, it's not just that the menu is different and better. Um, you are surrounded by norms about eating and everything that will just shape automatically how you find it natural to eat. Um, and many Americans apparently report losing a lot of weight when they go to Italy, by the way. Um, so, uh, so if you have a lot of money and you want to lose weight, just go to Italy. Um, so, and I think most, if, or at least much of the influence here is unconscious. If you're living in New York City or New Orleans or in rural Bhutan, you're going to live differently. And it's not just because you were raised differently and not just because the incentives are different. Your mindset's going to be different. In fact, your preferences will be different. Part of lifestyle architecture, it's actually not just choice. So some Stephen Taylor call it choice architecture. Really what this affects is also our preferences, which I think is a much more important thing. Our preferences today as consumers bear the imprint of past policy decisions by the United States government in the past, and I'll illustrate in a moment. Um, I will not run with the term preference architecture because um, it's not gonna be a winner in uh, the political arena. Um, so, uh, a couple of quotes to kind of illustrate one, you know, some of the ways in which this is uh, influential. Uh, one about how hard it is to keep for a New Orleanian living in New York to really keep that mindset. Like, again, your your state of mind, your kind of personality changes when you go from one to the other environment. Um, I find that I walk differently in both cities. Um, and I actually like what both cities do to me in a way. It's a very different vibe, very different feel. Um, the, the architect of Central Park, Frederick Law Olmsted, a really cool guy, um, 
wrote about how the impact of the park uh, it affected people's behavior and their demeanor. Um, I'll read something that my father wrote. It's, this is this phenomenon is something I experienced as well. Um, essentially, it's a bicultural um, moving between two radically different environments for m over many years. Um, so this is from a manuscript he wrote from his journals. Uh, the most direct measure of the effects of being on the island was the odd experience of returning home to my mainland life. Over the years, as I learned to be on the island, I found that for some weeks after coming back to the site of my normal life, I had to undergo a process of relearning how to be myself. Back in my mainland surroundings, reading Ron Habern's mail, wearing Ron Habern's clothes, answering Ron Habern's telephone, I gradually reassumed the Ron Habern persona. I found that the identity which had been assembled over the years, the identity I called me, was, a, was as much a product of my surroundings, my context, as it was an expression of my true nature. Um, and you can actually see in pictures of him, he looks different. He looks like a different person in the different environments. Okay, now turning to policy examples. I'm just going to focus on two. One is urban planning, the other one is um, uh, uh, has to do with food. Um, so one thing that's happened is, uh, for a variety of reasons, you know, we've um, uh, changed the way we build communities in this country. To the right is an older community uh, in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I can't speak for the rest of the city. Um, but this neighborhood, a, a friend of mine, actually, of, uh, Professor Zelinsky's as well, uh, took this picture. Um, this is a neighborhood where the kids run around. It's like, this is today. It's like the old-fashioned neighborhood. People aren't worried about the boogeyman snatching them up. Um, when, they, when these guys moved in to their house a few years back, um, a neighbor, while they were out, just let themselves into the house and left a pie in the refrigerator. A stranger let themselves into a person's house that they never met and left them a pie. Um, and that's actually, there, there's a zillion stories like that. It's quite, they're actually, it's such a cool neighborhood, they're filming apparently the next Halloween movie there. Um, <laughs> at Halloween, the parents go door to door getting jello shots. Um, and then, uh, the, and meanwhile, the kids are at home eating all the candy, I guess. But um, so to the left is a neighborhood I visit. A friend of mine lived here. Um, uh, where uh, this is typical recent development, these are like four to 5,000 square foot homes um, occupied by like three people. Um, there's no reason ever to walk out of your house in this neighborhood except to get in your car and drive away as far as you can. Um, and one of the things that's striking, and this is, I mean, I knew we were gonna be there when, you know, because the street is named for a tree and you won't see any trees there. The only trees I saw were three uh, palm trees in this one backyard with the pool. And I thought, well, that's really weird. How do they get these big palm trees in St. Louis? Uh, well, they're made of metal. Um, so I call this neighborhood Tin Palms. Um, at least some of the people who build homes like these don't even like them. Uh, one developer said, "This we call this the ultimate home for families who don't want anything to do with one another. Right? Um, in this neighborhood, uh, and by the way, I live in the suburbs of St. Louis. I'm, I'm not criticizing people who live here. Um, people buy homes for lots of reasons. Part of it is what's on the menu. St. Louis is a profoundly dysfunctional city, uh, metro area. Um, part of the reason this happens is we are pioneers of racial segregation. And this was partly built to, um, to enforce that, uh, or it's the remnants of that. Anyway, nonetheless, um, uh, how you build the communities has huge impacts on social relationships, which we know is one of the most, if not the most important thing for well-being or happiness. Um, and actually, Mark was talking about the importance of relationships for happiness in the fuller sense. Three similar city blocks in Bristol in England. Uh, at the top is low traffic, and the lines in between are represent, each line represents a connection between neighbors in the neighborhood where they interact with each other socially. At the top, very dense, very close-knit neighborhood. At the bottom, very sparse. They hardly know each other. In the middle, in between. Well, at the bottom is the high traffic neighborhood. Um, the middle is medium traffic, and then the top is uh, low traffic neighborhood. One simple variable makes a huge difference in people's, the quality of people's experience of their, the, their community life. Um,
All right, I'm going to throw, there's a video which uh, I had meant to insert there. I think I'm going to throw it in anyway. Um, so let's see if this works. <coughs> if this doesn't work, probably best. It's, it's like two minutes of a guy, James Howard Kunstler, um, talking about what um, our architecture does to our minds. Um, it's not working, is it? Um, I don't think, uh, this isn't really important, but. Oh, oh there we go. Thank you. It mutates over the next 80 years, and it turns into something rather insidious. It becomes a cartoon of a country house and a cartoon of the country. And that's the great non-articulated agony of suburbia and one of the reasons that it lends itself to ridicule because it hasn't delivered what it's been promising for half a century now. You know, and th these, are, these are typically the kind of dwellings we find. They're you know, basically a house with nothing on the side, because this house wants to state emphatically, I'm a little cabin in the woods. There's nothing on either side of me. I don't have any eyes on the side of my head. I can't see. So you have this one last facade of the house, the front, which is really a, a cartoon of a facade of a house. Because uh, notice the porch here. Unless the people who live here are munchkins, uh, nobody's going to be using that. This is really affecting television. Broadcasting a show 24-7 called We're Normal. We're normal, we're normal, we're normal, we're normal, we're normal. Please respect us, we're normal, we're normal, we're normal. But we know what's going on in these houses. You know, we know that little Skippy is loading his Uzi down here. <laughs> Getting ready for a homeroom. We know that Heather... The sister Heather, 14 years old, is, is turning tricks up here to support her drug habit <laughs> because these places, these habitats, are inducing immense amounts of anxiety and depression in children, and they don't have a lot of experience with medication. So they take the first one that comes along often. These are not good enough for Americans. Uh, these are the schools we're sending them to. The Hannibal Lecter Central School. <laughs> Las Vegas, Nevada. It's a real school. You know, but there's obviously a notion that if you let the inmates of this thing out, that they would snatch a motorist off the street and eat his liver. <laughs> so that every effort is made to keep them within the, the building. Notice that nature is present. Um, that, that's from a brilliant uh, TED Talk. Um, you might not agree with it. Uh, Probably won't agree with this perspective, but anyway, it's entertaining. Um, but it is, you know, our places have a big effect on our uh, state of mind. And I, I'm raising kids in that environment that he's talking about. And um, we're keeping the Uzis out of the house. And anyway, I don't think there's a drug habit. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but what, we, what could you do from a policy perspective? Well, one thing you could do is at least stop subsidizing suburban sprawl. Because right now, the, like Tin Palms, that was paid for by people living elsewhere. The, the infrastructure is put out there. Um, and uh, so it's heavily subsidized, heavily favored. Um, and uh, maybe we could build communities that aren't designed to isolate people from each other. And this isn't just a lefty thing. There's a movement called Front Porch Conservatism that really thinks this, this, this sort of thing is a huge problem from a conservative perspective. Um, uh, decimating communities and fragmenting uh, communal relationships is not a conservative project. Um, so, and so you change the incentives, say, in terms of the government policy. Um, if you make much of a change in the way urban planning is done in our living spaces, um, you're going to change the ways people are nudged in, in huge ways. I'm, I'm fairly certain housing tastes will change. Our housing tastes partly bear the impact imprint of past decisions that created the suburbs. Um, uh, just another example, uh, in Canada, they passed a carbon tax, uh, 25%, uh, 25 cents on a gallon. Um, and as you'd expect, the gas consumption went down because the price went up. But they also, they put like stickers on the pumps, rubbing people's noses in the fact that they're being charged more for the gas. They're, you know, you're being taxed for your gas. Um, what happened is actually people reduced their consumption even more than you'd expect from the price alone. What happened is this created a nudge 
that changed their attitudes and got them thinking, you know, maybe I shouldn't be driving as much. Um, so uh, uh, so it, it's partly incentives, partly nudges. Uh, one other thing, um, back in the, starting really in the 70s, we started uh, agricultural subsidies. You know, now corn is sold for much less than it costs to grow it, and that's paid for by you and me, the taxpayers. Um, and what happened was, um, uh, now, like what that guy's eating at the top there, um, uh, uh, well, his hearse awaits, is, um, is really just variations of corn. Is uh, just corn manufactured. You can make almost anything out of corn. You make che corn cheap enough and market found ways to use it. Um, well, what's happened then is effectively we're subsidizing junk food. That's where junk food comes from, is various forms of corn. Um, if we simply did what economists have been telling us for years to do, economists hate these subsidies. Get rid of the subsidies, have honest pricing for food, um, then, uh, there, then junk food wouldn't be cheaper. That, a burger like that would not be remotely affordable for most people. When I was you know, growing up, you couldn't afford meat like that. I mean, we ate meat, but it wasn't like... You just bought mountains of it. I actually tried finding one of these burgers. This is from St. Louis. Uh, two deep fried patties, burgers, uh, cheese, mayonnaise, and a Krispy Kreme donut and bacon. Um, uh, I don't think it looks good, but it's kind of interesting. Um, so, but, you know, people's idea, our idea of a good meal is very different from what our grandparents' idea of a good meal was. It's not that they were hungry or didn't have enough to eat. It's that... It's just, um, you know, we live in an environment where we're used to now massive portions, right? And, and, uh, and just certain ways of eating, and like where meat has a much bigger role in the American diet today than it used to. So um, in terms of uh, advantages of this kind of approach to nudging lifestyle infrastructure, uh, it's a more powerful tool, certainly. Um, I think it's less like manipulation because you're just working through ordinary processes of social change. You're not actually targeting people's behaviors directly. Nobody uh, is manipulating particular choices. You're changing the context in a way. Say you build more parks. Um, eventually, if there's more parks and parks are more part of life, people's idea of what are attractive leisure activities will change. Um, uh, uh, through the course of moves over life, my ideas of my preferences for leisure have changed, right? It's just... Um, so um, I think it's also more efficient. You don't need a big bureaucracy necessarily to do this. And, um, and also, uh, I just, I really don't like the idea of the government making too many of these little decisions. It's also likely to be more transparent. If you're making fewer and bigger decisions, they're more likely to get public scrutiny. Maybe I'm overly optimistic about um, uh, public scrutiny, but um, I want to acknowledge though, that there are real risks to this sort of thing. Um, I like to think of societies, economies, and I, I'm not, I mean, I didn't invent this idea, right? A lot of economists like thinking of it this way too, and, and, and Derek was talking about it this way. It's an, like an ecosystem, and I work with a conservation biologist. You tinker with ecosystems at your peril. Um, it's very easy to screw things up. They're immensely complex. There's many cases of good intentions gone wrong because you introduce a new species to control some other species, and sure enough, things go bananas. Um, but sometimes it does work. Like when they reintroduced wolves to Yellowstone, it was a cascade of beneficial effects for the ecosystem. It, it, they had no idea how much it would transform the ecosystem. Um, the fish you find there are different now. The trees you find are different because of wolves. Um, it's just so cool. Um, uh, but again, you have to be really careful. Um, and this is going to be, I think... Um, this uh, complexity issue is, is the biggest area for reasonable disagreement about to what extent we should be engaged in this stuff. Um, but again, any approach to policy is going to have these effects, uh, is going to affect how we're nudged. Um, so I think the question is whether we pay attention to it. In my view, you may not agree, but I think our post-war policy arguably nudged us into a regime of widespread loneliness and obesity. Um, Americans, on average, have two confidants, two people they can talk to about important things. Um, a quarter of the population is zero. Um, in Bhutan, uh, the number of people who 
uh, reported having friends who are close enough that they could count on them to help them out in a medical emergency is more than the scale allowed. It, it maxed out, most people maxed out at over eight. Um, I don't know what the number is in the United States, but I bet it's lower. Um, I'm not saying, I, I, I'm glad I live here, not in Bhutan, but anyway, but they've got something, you know, that um, we could uh, use. Um, so suppose citizens want a policy, they have a voice in shaping it, and they're glad of it after the fact. Their lifestyles make more sense to them and fit their values. Um, I'm not sure what's wrong in that case. Uh, let me start wrapping it up here. So just about, you know, so what, what would be a better way to treat people with respect? Um, willfully ignoring the lifestyle infrastructure effects of our choices on their lives or taking account of those effects and promoting a lifestyle infrastructure that better serves their values. Um, it's not clear to me that the first one is a better way to treat people with respect. Um, now, uh, as you can guess, I'm, you know, I tend, I've passed, I've, I've been known to pass as libertarian in, in, uh, at times, but I don't think anybody's going to make that mistake today. Um, but uh, I want to emphasize that this framework could be appealing to conservatives. It's not just big government lefties um, and even to libertarians, I think, um, although I may get corrected sharply here. Um, uh, so a libertarian might say, look, the benefits of a minimal government owe partly to the influence of nudges. That is, we're nudged in certain ways when we live in a free society with a free economy, you know, with a lot of economic freedom. So, for instance, um, capitalism uh, may and I think does foster various virtues. Uh, Professor McCluskey wrote a wonderful book about this. Um, uh, cooperativeness, honesty, optimism, self-reliance. You go to a communist country, you don't see those to this, you know, the same way. Um, it's one of the things I really like about the United States when I come back from other countries. It's like we're warm, friendly, open, optimistic. Um, that's kind of cool. Um, so, um, uh, and we don't have minimal government, by the way. <laughs> um, so, and it's not just through rational choice, right? The environment is just going to make it kind of seem natural to be that way in a market economy. It's not like people decide, you know, I think I'm going to be honest um, because, I, because capitalism. It's just not how it works. <laughs> um, and the, but the effects, I think this is crucially different from the sunstein Thaler approach. The effects, the nudges flow organically from the social structure, not from it, uh, tedious administrative meddling. <laughs> so, uh, if you looked at our, our food choices, you might think we don't care much about our health. If you look at our housing choices, you might think we don't value our relationships. If you look at our spending and work choices, you might think our values are materialistic. We hear that a lot, right? Uh, both from the right and the left, right? Uh, you know, cons many conservatives have the same complaints. Um, but maybe the problem is in our values. Maybe our values are actually pretty normal and healthy. We love our kids, and, and I care about our health and our happiness as much as anyone does. Um, but maybe we live in an environment, have a lifestyle infrastructure that's part of the problem. Maybe we're being nudged uh, it, it, to want and choose things that undermine our values. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be easier for us to attain the kind of lives we want if the environment isn't a wash in nudges that run counter to our values. Um, and I think, I think. Um, policy ought to attend to lifestyle infrastructure and try to promote structures that uh, will enhance our quality of life rather than undermine it. Um, put another way, I think good policy should not lend it, land us, as I think it may have, in a well-being version of the Stanford Prison Experiment. Um, and I'm going to end on with a little epilogue and a happy note. At the start, I mentioned Slew Medical School, how miserable uh, the students were. Well, uh, that's not inevitable. Um, uh, the med school was really bothered by this, so they instituted sweeping changes. Um, they, they did do some positive psychology things like resilience and mindfulness training. Um, but as I said, like, look, you could do mindfulness training until the cows come home. If you don't fix the toxic environment, that's, it's only going to do so much. And so they also changed the environment, the curriculum, social support, um, I have, I, um, I, I have no doubt, it just changed the vibe of the whole uh, institution. Um, and so they're being nudged in a lot of different ways. I'm fairly certain of it. Um, over, 
Uh, from 2008 to 2016, we found among first-year medical students, depression uh, plummeted from 28% to 6% um, about what it was for the students before they even arrived. Um, Anxiety uh, from 56% to 14%. Those, th this is one of the most effective interventions I'm aware of ever being done. Um, it's not a controlled experiment, right? They didn't, you know, this was just things they did at school, so we're not quite sure what worked or what didn't. But something worked. Um, one student told the guy who instigated this, uh, at least one student said, you saved my life. Um, uh, there's no evidence. You might think, well, yeah, but you can, yeah, but are they now like really lame, bad doctors or whatever? Um, there's no evidence of a negative impact. Uh, test scores, I think, if might have gone up if that. Uh, no evidence that they went down. Uh, placements and residencies and so forth, they're just as successful as before, if not more so. Um, so, uh, so here's an example where I think we can really make a difference by paying attention to. Uh, creating better situations for ourselves. Uh, sort of going a little long, but uh, thank you for bearing with me. And I'll, I'll take questions or 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 abuse. Um, no, no, no abuse. Um, questions or comments? Yeah. So. I'm kind of curious about how you would do this with implementation. For example, I've heard that China has now embarked on a program where they are trying to evaluate um, people's sort of conformity and um, adoption of the government's uh, view of what it takes to be a good person. So they're actually going to keep track of people's activities, like how much uh, how much they spend on video games, how much time they spend on the internet, uh, other kinds of choices that they make. And all of this is so that they can get a value ranking of individuals in terms of how closely they are in alliance with the government perspective. And so when, when you talk about this, how would you kind of characterize this as maybe interfering with the other you know, the sense of individuality, values that are expressed by Mill, and maybe, you know, some of our framers. Basic. So, so it's two questions. Really. Yeah. So how do you evaluate the implementation factor? And then two, you know, you're talking long term policy results, though, and then how do these two things develop core values of individuality? Right. So um, the China thing, actually, I have not had it. I, I, maybe on the plane ride back, I'll take a look at it because I just became aware of that. That's terrifying. So China is what they're, um, they're rating citizens. They're proposing to, maybe they've already started, each of you would get a rating by the government for how good a person you are, how good a citizen you are. This is one of the creepiest, most terrifying, <laughs> like, I, you know, um, it makes all of our other privacy concerns, everything at the internet, like pale. Um, and uh, I would give up a lot of things that I want, if necessary, to prevent that from happening here. I don't think we're close to that yet here. But by the way, we live in a country where most people seem to accept cheerfully that, you know, it's okay for employers to just make us pee in a cup on a routine basis, which... If you care about freedom, I mean, I don't know how you can care about freedom and think that's cool. I mean, I think my grandfather would have shot somebody who proposed he be in a cup for them. Um, so we've already gone way down this uh, well, the road to serfdom, I guess, in Hayek's term. Um, <laughs> so I take it that that, um, I, I think that's in line with my concern maybe about the point intervention approach of Sunstein and Thaler um, of really... Uh, I, I, um, I, I actually don't have a great sense for how to avoid that, except, I mean, certainly if we have any at attachment to liberal principles, and I take us all pretty much in this country, even conservatives, to be attached to some sort of liberal principle, taking liberty seriously, um, how, how we, I would think we wouldn't go for that. I mean, China is just a profoundly illiberal, it's a communist totalitarian government. Um, Although I thought they were better than that. Um, <laughs> clearly I'm wrong. Um, 
But yeah, so um, I mean, it sure doesn't seem to me to treat people with respect, but it's actually, I, I think it's not obvious how to frame exactly what's wrong with that. Like what explains why this is so creepy. Um, uh, in general, I don't know, you know, I, I, I won't speculate further on what might be done about that, but I think that that sort of thing, um, actually, when I get to the policy book about this stuff, that may be in chapter one is like, let's not do this. And let's not put ourselves on a slippery slope to that either. I, I take that sort of risk seriously. Um, your other question about like individuality and stuff, I think that's also an important concern, especially now with the, um, with, well, in the diet case, I'm not a fan of the Bloomberg soda bands and stuff like that. That's exactly the sort of thing where it's like, yeah, really, you think you're going to transform our lives by, you know, micromanaging, you know, what kind of, what I drink at the baseball game or, you know, it's just, um, and it's just so intrusive. Um, uh, and that's why I think something at the level of at least honest pricing, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm a little wary of subsidizing healthy food, say, I mean, cause you could go further and then subsidize healthy food. Um, I'm inclined to think maybe we just not go that far in that, but at least if we got rid of the subsidies, I don't think, I mean, that's not intrusive at all. And it's something that libertarian economists love for independent, for other reasons. Um, but the housing thing, the urban planning, urban planning, I, I'm still getting my mind around that. I don't know that field well. It's a really interesting, huge field um, that has not been adequately explored in this connection. Um, people have different prior preferences about where to live, and it's not just shaped by the government. Right? We, um, some people, uh, uh, conservatives, Republicans tend to prefer rural areas and like lots more space. Uh, liberals, lefties like the walkable neighborhoods, the more, you know, like Amsterdam or, you know, uh, like you have in Europe. Um, that appeals more to liberals, to like Democrats. Republicans tend to favor more the wide open spaces and kind of being away from each other. This is democracy. You have to respect citizens. I mean, for one thing, you have to, citizens have to be as much as possible in control of this. Um, uh, what I would say about the, the suburb thing is like, I bet the preference is more for rural living um, and not for this kind of ersatz. And what Kunstler was kind of getting at was um, this sort of phony ersatz um, wilderness, you know, that you get without trees or anything there. And it's, it's um, you do get space. And again, there's rational reasons to buy those houses. I mean, if you live here, you buy any domicile you can afford. <laughs> you don't worry about whether it has trees, I would think. Um, so, um, but yeah, there's diversity that we have to respect and, um, and I worry about that because for one thing, denser, the denser housing that, uh, that lefties like better is also better for the environment in general. I would love to find creative ways that you could have the less dense housing preferred by conservatives while still, um, you know, not being, uh, you know, while still dealing with, uh, uh, you know, not being, being less wasteful about it. Um, because, uh, I mean, I'm sort of, I'm sort of a country boy myself and, you know, um, I don't want to live, I, I'll live in a condo or an apartment, but I kind of, you know, so yes, there, there is this, we have to take diversity really seriously. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, a couple of questions. So you said the preferences, are something that we want to um, vote on and have it be the value of, of like so stuff we all value. Um, as a more conservative person living in California, everybody votes against me all the time. Um, so that would suck if the majority got to rule what I was doing. And to the second point where you're talking about suburbia, um, in Thomas Sowell's book of uh, Myths and Fallacies in Economics, he talks about people saying urban planning and that they're trying to do all this stuff with urban planning. They should just let people live however they want to. And then people can express their preferences based on where they live. And so you're saying that we don't want people to express their preferences or we want to nudge them into what? Um, uh, so, Uh, one of the tricky things with urban planning is 
uh, as a general rule, that housing has to be built. And um, it tend, and I don't know the ins and outs of how it happens. In a lot of towns, what happens is a developer pays off the mayor, or the city council, or whatever, and gets nice concessions and gets them to build the infrastructure out to the neighborhood and everything. And then people end up there. Um, uh, industry capture is a huge problem with, with housing and ur urban planning. Um, one way or another, we have to build streets. We need to allocate resources for doing stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure the best way to handle it because we're not uh, we're not the Netherlands. I mean, I, I don't live in the Netherlands because I'm not Dutch. I'm American. I, I a little bit too much of a redneck for that. Um, so, uh, and now to an extent where something is actually infringing on people's rights, people's liberties, then majoritarian rule, you know, we should, we need to have some provisions, you know, I mean, that's the bill of rights and so forth. Um, but, uh, I think we have to be careful that it, we're not. Um, the democracy I, doesn't really work. Yeah, um, I mean, it probably. I, I, again, yeah, I, I think this would be. Um, this is more of an invitation um, that we have urban planning conferences and figure out how this stuff works. And because um, I actually don't have concrete solutions to offer in that thing, but. Uh, all I offer is let's pay attention to the massive effects that our decisions are going to have. One way or another, governments are making decisions and they're somehow involved. Um, and uh, and it's not just, it's not purely free enterprise, it's not purely individuals, not in our country. Uh, maybe we could deregulate and let it, leave it totally to free enterprise. I don't know how that would work though. Um, so yeah, this is massively complex and I, I'm, I, I'm hoping to, yeah, get more ideas on that because I don't know. But yeah, I don't want to make I don't want to make Republicans live in you know the city. You know, if they don't want to, um, I don't want to make anyone live anywhere they don't want to. Like that's what China does. Um, uh, Deirdre. Yeah, well, I, I, in, um, in Adam Smith's book, The Nature of Gods is the Wealth of Nations, in 1776, the word policy is in those days police. That's what it, that, that's what it was. But they didn't have the word policy. They used the word police. And that's that's that eliminates the situation here. In order to have a policy, you've got to compel, you've got to force people violently. And that's the danger. Give over these kinds of powers to the government. Has, uh, I think you are, are sensitive to this, but it has great danger. Because I don't think the past six, since 9 11, or the affair of all lives, a matter of um, retirement. If you're African American, especially. Your life expectancy is significantly lower than a white man. It's irrational for you to save vast amounts for old age. That isn't going to happen for you. Um, furthermore, as I think you also aware and I'm sure you are, very easy for, for, for governments to nudge in bad ways. 1930s in Germany, you can, you can think of that. The German word for vermin was used in Hitler's government as a synonym for Jews. And this was a policy. This was enforced. And so when the Germans started to think of Jews as vermin or rats. So I, I you know, I. I think you're, you're you're kind of assuming a left-wing um, enthusiasm for large group of government, assuming that city planning, for example, is a good idea, uh, a nuisance, it doesn't have city planning. Chicago does, and as you suggested, um, 
Who doesn't have city plan in Houston? Houston. So, yeah, I, and I think this is just one of these areas where uh, we're going to have be coming at this from, you know, uh, I do have more of the kind of lefty enthusiasm for government to be, you know, uh, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm cool with that. I recognize the risks. Now, uh, there's kind of, there's two stages to the position that I was talking about here. One is, um, you know, the specific examples I was giving, like urban planning and the food policy, those might be areas where um, one might argue, and I mean, some of my friends do argue, well, government just shouldn't be involved in that. And that, so then, so that part of my talk, yeah, it's just, that's going to be an area where we just disagree. Um, but then one could still use the, the, the nudging framework, the, the lifestyle infrastructure uh, framework um, as partly a basis actually for arguing precisely that, that we should not, um, and, and that was kind of what I was trying to hint at about how libertarians might like this framework. Now, the libertarian I was referring to in that page, and I'm not saying you would agree at all, but um, would reject most likely what I was saying about urban planning. So, so there's so uh, I'm not endorsing the libertarian position that I was talking about on that slide. Um, I'm suggesting, and actually I should be clear about that. Somebody who took that position would reject a lot of the other stuff I talk about. Um, and uh, my own view is, I, I don't know, for whatever it's worth, um, a lot of my instincts are sort of, I mean, it's sort of fishing village, you know, like keep the government out of my life and all that. But I also feel like that doesn't work in modern society. I mean, this is just a basic ideological disagreement that we have. And, um, and I think there's a lot of merit to your position. Um, and I, I, you know, and that's one of the things I welcome about. Um, one last thing, actually, I will say, I need to thank my funders, Templeton Foundation, but also um, the IHS for uh, younger people. I, I think, so I'm not a libertarian, but... Um, they put on a lot of really cool stuff, and I just think it's, uh, um, you know, and I'm grateful for this uh, this venue. And it's not, um, anyway, my students benefited a lot from it, and um, uh, I would encourage everybody to take a look and see if there are opportunities for you um, with IHS. Um, I think I went on too long. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. <laughs>